is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. Today, we are getting an introduction into sports betting, optimal practices, and some of the keys to look for trying to fill out the best bets you can with Ed Miller. Uh, He wrote a book with Matthew David out last year called The Logic of Sports Betting. We're talking with Ed about some of the keys to finding good bets, ways to do so, why parlays aren't as bad as their perception, and a whole lot more. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Feng. You can find his work at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Been watching a lot of soccer uh, yeah. and just, uh, yeah, enjoying enjoying the lot of sports. I'm Did sure you, you watch, are as well. I didn't watch soccer, even though well, we had the wonderful Alex Heiner on last week. He gave us good recommendations. He, he talked me through uh, where to find good information. I still didn't watch. Uh, but how, how was the, the Bundesliga action? I mean, the Bundesliga is great. I mean, Bayern Munich went to Dortmund yesterday. Uh, I kind of forgot about it, so... <laughs> Uh, I haven't actually, I've, I've watched about the first hour of it um, on tape delay, which I'm okay with. Like, I mean, I know we talk Do about Do you know the outcome? Stuff, but not, not from what okay. I, not, I mean, I do now because yeah. I had to go, I had to go grab some data for some home field stuff I want to talk about a little yeah. bit later. Um, but I think that match uh, exemplifies like why I love soccer so much. Um, it's It's such a, and especially German soccer, like Dortmund is such a, a like a very fast, a lot of passing, uh, really kind of the definition of the, uh, the be- they they play the beautiful game. Right. Yeah. When when they call when we call the sport the beautiful game, like I think that's a really good example of it. Very skilled all across, um, you know, all all 11 players. And then Bayern Munich is the more talented team. Um, you know, they're not going to play as much as the the passing game, but they just have superstars like Lewandowski and and their keeper Manuel Neuer is just is has been a game changer in terms of the way he plays, like kind of the sweeper keeper. So oftentimes, you know, Dortmund at the very beginning had you know had a guy they they look like was was going to get in for a breakaway and a shot on goal, and and Neuer comes out and just you know pops it away, just just perfect timing, right? Perfect instance, perfect timing. So I think that game, you know, I think for some American sports fan, it's hard to really convince them like why a one nothing soccer game is so amazing. But that game was was phenomenal. I, mean, I think that it's kind of it's something we can talk about with like American football, too, where you can have a good low scoring football game as long as it's not low scoring because of sloppy offense. And it sounds like with yeah. the with that game, the, the Dortmund game, it sounds like that was a case where it was just really good tactical defense that prevented yeah. any lower scoring. I think for me, like I love a good high scoring game. It always is my preference, but I can watch a lower scoring game if it's not lower scoring because of sloppiness. I think that that's kind of the thing to yeah. me is it all comes down to sloppiness when determining if it's a good game or not, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I think there's many aspects to that, right? Like I, I never liked it when people hated the Alabama nine LSU six yeah. game. Right. And that wasn't necessarily sloppy offense. It was just the defenses were so good that they dominated the game. And I think you can find a lot of beauty in, in that as well. Uh, and just a lot of good offense uh, and uh, a game that really flows. So was it weird with like the pumped in crowd music? Because again, I, oh, right. I haven't watched. Was it was it weird? <laughs> or what did you think of it? No, you know, it was actually kind of felt normal. Uh, so, so I think what's weird is the empty stadium in which you hear like the echoing of like the three guys that are yelling on the side <laughs> that is weird when you get when you get the pumping in of you know the the songs that the crowd usually sings that is kind of normal until you realize like wait mm-hmm. that's not actual fans singing those songs um so and you know you always kind of ask yourself about what it means for for home field advantage Dortmund was at home they ended up losing one nothing so it's not necessarily that the loudspeakers with the pseudo fans, uh, you know, had any impact on that game, obviously right. small sample size and all that. But, um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I think it kind of felt normal. It'd be interesting to see like what stadiums try that strategy and whether it works. I think it's a little bit more natural, at least from the kind of the TV audience to have some of that, to have some, have some of those pseudo fans in there. I want I want to fully embrace the Korea baseball organization's mindset of we're going to put Pokemon dolls in 
<laughs> the seats instead because it looks hilarious. Um, it brings levity to a very weird moment. And I'm like, you know what? I'm good with this. If we're going to have something be weird, let's lean into the weirdness and just put Pokemon dolls. In, but in like Pokemon of the actual Pokemon size, right? Like dog, like small dog type size. I think so. Not- I actually don't know what size Poke. They were Pokemon cards were banned at my like elementary slash middle school. So I didn't get to learn. <laughs> I never got my full education in Pokemon. Uh, I've, because like I've you seen... could get you could get like suspended if you brought one in because people were like trading valuable. I don't know. It was weird. It was very strange. Yeah, I've I've seen a few Pokemon cartoons and they're like small dogs. They're like my dog. Yeah. So I think that was they're they're about that size, but All it right. just looks very strange. And I want to embrace the weird effectively. So uh-huh. I need to be sold on, on the crowd noise. But selling me on Pokemon in the stands. That part's not not hard at all. As mentioned, we're going to have Ed Miller on. He is the co-author of The Logic of Sports Betting. Uh, He wrote that book with Matthew David out last year. We were going to have Matthew on, but uh, he just became a father. So congratulations to Matthew. Uh, Congratulations to the entire family on that. We'll talk with Ed about the book, about some of the keys they discuss in the book. And Ed, you had a chance to talk to them last year, and you've read the book too it seems like a really fun read and a lot of good things just from a math perspective about how to be a smarter, better. Yeah, no, it's a absolutely, I would say like, if you, if you want to make money betting on sports, it's an essential read. Uh, Cause the perspective is very different. Um, and the information in terms of uh, the different types of sports book out there in terms of market making books and I guess not market making books. I forget what they called it. <laughs> That's really crucial to understand. And then, you know, the stuff, there's a whole section in the end where he talks about how to take advantage of sportsbook bonuses, yeah. which is awesome. And it's just something that you kind of never think about. You know, even me as a math guy, I just never think about how to take advantage of sportsbook bonuses. But but there is a way. I don't really remember the math behind it, but it's a reason to check out the book. Yeah, for sure. There's and- a reason. There's a reason that, I mean, there's a way to get positive EVV from sportsbook bonuses, essentially. You just got to be smart about it. And uh, we were talking with Teddy Savransky before the college football championship about how books will run additional uh, promos and stuff like that around big events. So always a good time to kind of perk up, especially with sports coming back. They're going to be running promos. So uh, definitely, <laughs> believe me, they're going to be running promos to lure people back in. They may not need to, but they're going to do it. So just so you're aware. Uh, sure. I think they're going to need to, right? I mean, you, you're losing months of growth here, right? I mean, they're. I think the the books are going to try to you're jump losing start months that. of growth, yeah. but also engagement because people have just been checked right. out from sports for so long that you need to draw them back in. What better way to draw them back in than with juicy, juicy lines? We'll also talk with Ed about uh, his company with Matthew, Deck Prism Sports, which uh, in, or d- delves into live betting, uh, provides numbers to sports books and all that. So should be a fun conversation with Ed. Before we dive into that, though, we have to look back at last week. We had Alex Heinert on to preview the Bundesliga and talk about uh, some betting information around that. Alex had a couple of plays. We actually do have a cover in the past to discuss before we move on to Ed's stuff later on. Covering the past. Last week here on Covering the Spread, we had Alex Heinert on to discuss the Bundesliga and a couple of things that Alex mentioned. Um, he wanted the Dusseldorf money line, and that one wound up in a draw with FC Cologne. I don't actually know these teams very well, so if I say them wrong, apologies. Uh, he thought that Leverkusen was undervalued in their Saturday match, and he wanted to bet the draw because of that. However, Leverkusen perfor- outperformed even Alex's expectations. They won that match outright 3-1. to one. So being in a Leverkusen, good. Just the outcome, uh, not quite where he, he wanted it. Uh, the final one was a match between Dortmund and Wolfsburg. Alex wanted the draw there, but Dortmund pulled out a 2 to nothing victory. Uh, so... So, some tough ones there, but I think being high in Leverkusen, definitely good there for Alex. Make sure you check out uh, Alex's Twitter account, which we discussed last week on the show. Check out Alex's show, too, because a lot of good general Bundesliga knowledge, talking about markets you can bet for soccer, where you can find information, and finding all that. And, Ed, sports wouldn't be back if it weren't for tough beats. Like, my run in NASCAR ever since it came back in those three races, it's been terrible. Like, for the second Darlington race, I had Clint Boyer at 40-1. to 1. Uh, He won the opening two stages, and then he wrecked. 
Then yeah. Sunday, Coca-Cola 600 had Alex Bowman 12 to one. Stays out in two tires, gets the lead, maintains it, leads 164 laps. He wins the opening two stages too, and then he falls down to 19th on the final restart. So it's been a rough run, and I feel like we didn't have sports betting fully back until the bad beats returned, and we are fully back now, baby. Yeah. Well, I mean, but when you're when you're betting guys to win now. NASCAR is pretty. I mean, you can easily go three races without nailing one of those. Oh, so absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I wouldn't. I wouldn't be too worried about that. And I mean, like I had Harvick at seven to one to win the opening one, so it's not like it's been like I'm not bleeding money. But it's like what could have been. I still have that in my yeah. mind. So uh, yeah. we are fully back when that's there for sure. We can always dream on the possibilities at least. Yep. Uh, so thanks, Alex Heiner, once again for coming on to discuss that. Before we get to Ed Miller, FanDuel Sportsbook is now available in Colorado. But what's a sportsbook with no sports? Well, it's FanDuel Anything Book, FanDuel's newest free game. Each day, you will pick one free prop, like the weather, stocks, or anything, pick it right to win 5 bucks inside credit, and then play again tomorrow. Play FanDuel Anything book for free only on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21 plus, max bonus $50. Visit FanDuel.com slash audio for terms. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. That is especially pertinent with the discussion we just had around sportsbook promos. Hey, you got one out there in Colorado, so take advantage while you can. Let's talk now to Ed Miller. You can find Ed on Twitter at Ed Miller Poker. We're going to, just going to discuss his book with Matthew Davidow, The Logic of Sports Betting, and also his company, Deck Prism Sports. Let's make ourselves a little smarter as, be- smarter as betters with Ed Miller. Covering the present. Let's welcome Ed Miller into Covering the Spread. Ed, I want to thank you for taking the time, for swinging by for today. How are you doing? Hey, how are y'all doing? I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, it's a weird time, uh, so I, I always feel weird asking how people are doing because it's, you know, there could be a wide range of answers. Usually it's just, right. oh, yeah, I'm good. How are you? So people it's... are, like, crying in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Why would you ask me that question? What is wrong right. with you? Right. Uh, but, Ed, you know, we're in the sports betting business. It's been kind of a weird couple of months. Uh, you do a lot of poker stuff, too, so have you been playing more poker to occupy time the past couple of months? What have you done to keep yourself busy? Yeah, no, well, so we have a, a, a startup business. My partner, Matt, and, and me have a business called Deck Prism Sports. And so we've been, uh, you know, it's a sports betting business, but, you know, there's a lot of work that we have to do that, you know, whether there's sports on or not. So we've been kind of plugging away at that. What about you for, like, from a, to keep, to get your fix in? Have you, how, how have you been keeping yourself outside of work occupied? I mean, because it's like, are you betting on ping pong? What's going on here for you? <laughs> no, I'm actually not. I mean, I, I actually, I mean, it's hokey, but I spend more time with the family, which is good. You know, when yeah. you're, yeah. you got a startup business, sometimes you don't get enough family time. Yeah. In, so I've been spending time with my son and my wife and uh, it's been good. All right. Well, that is perfect. Well, the reason we wanted to have Ed on today is because about a year ago, uh, he and Matthew David, I wrote a book called The Logic of Sports Betting. It's been just almost exactly a year now. Uh, what brought about the inspiration for you and Matthew to write that book? Yeah, sure. So, you know, we kind of um, – so I, I so I met Matt about five years ago, and we started working on sports betting stuff, m- building models. That's kind of the main work that I do is model building. And, um, and then when the Supreme Court thing happened and we kind of saw the direction everything was going in this country – you know, we said, well, things are about to change, you know, a lot. And um, that's kind of when we decided to start our company. And at the same time, we said, you know, it, it's funny, like when we first started our company, you know, our company is our, basically our company is that, that, you know, we provide betting odds uh, to sportsbook operators. And, you know, some of the early conversations we had with operators, even before people launched in New Jersey, people were like, what do we need good betting odds for? You know, people will bet anything. It was kind of, you know, what's <laughs> honestly some industry people told me. And I said, I said, well, I don't think that's really true. But if that is true, I feel like the American public might need a betting education a little bit. <laughs> and that was really kind of what started the book, as I said, you know, I don't I don't want to live in a country where. You know, it's true that, you know, people are are just ignorant and will bet anything. So, you know, and I didn't think it was true, but like <laughs> I was like, you know what, if we re- write this book, it's for sure not going to be true. You know, so that that was kind of the, the original inspiration, I would say. 
Awesome. Um, so the logic of sports betting is a great read. Uh, I've had a chance to get through all of it. Uh, give us some of the big concepts or things that you want a listener of this podcast to take away. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the, the book is, I mean, you know, so I kind of told you why we wrote the book and then kind of what's in the book kind of answers that question. It really fills you know, you in, especially if you're, it's it's an American focused sports betting book. A lot of sports betting happened overseas in Europe. A lot of the stuff that's written about it is kind of, you know, written for Europe. Everything's about soccer and tennis and, you know, and, and we're American, you know, Matt and I are American sports bettors and modelers. And, you know, we said, let's write kind of what the American sports better needs to know to get caught up. So we start with, you know, how does the industry work? Where do the lines come from? You know, when you open your, you know, sports book screen, you know, you, your app or your, you know, whatever it is on the desktop or wherever you bet. And, you know, you see all those lines, you know, you see, you know, lines for NFL and you see half lines and quarter lines and player props and, you know, all that stuff. And you see all these numbers. And the question is, well, where the heck do all these numbers come from, you know? Right. And, you know, and uh, we kind of answer that question in detail. I think I think it's not, I think it's an interesting answer. And I also think that if you want to be a good better, like it, you kind of have to know the answer to that to actually sure. be a good better. Right. So so that was kind of the first part of the book. And then kind of the second part is we talk to you about, you know, how do you go about trying to find some good bets? Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and don't forget the don't forget the part about uh, sports book bonuses at the very end, which is very right. entertaining. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> you were talking about making good bets, Ed. I think that uh, one of the topics discussed within that broader umbrella is looking for no hold markets. So yep. for people who don't know what that term means, what is a no hold market and how can people find them within their various sports books? Right. So I, I think there's some there's sort of like a almost like a little mystique around sports books and how they make their money. And, you know, there's this sort of, I call it like the Vegas knows mystique, right? Like this is like a, a meme almost on the internet where, you know, they, they, the total will be 193 and a half and it'll land 193 at the last second. And, you know, 18 people will say, oh my God, Vegas knows. How are they so good? <laughs> you know, and the answer is Vegas doesn't know, <laughs> you know, the, the, and, the, and the book sort of explains that, that 193 and a half gets bet into place basically by betters. Uh, the line gets moved around. And the, and the books are making money because they have a VIG on the market. So, like, if you have your, like, minus 110 on each side, I mean, the, the books make money because that minus 110 is on, each, you know, is on their side every time they take a bet, right? So, you know, and that's the reason why most bettors lose is because they're betting into that minus 110. You know, it's not that bettors are, like, really smart or dumb or anything. It's, like, a built-in advantage for the book. So the whole concept of the no-hold market says, well – for any given book, you're always going to be betting into, you know, minus 110 on each side. But if you could take two books and you can get minus 10 on one side of the bet and plus 10 on the other side of the bet. So in other words, they have slightly different prices. Well, what's it to you that that's at two different books? That's basically a no vig market for you, right? That's that's exactly the same to you if you get it at two different books as if it was one book offering you minus 110 on the other side, other side and plus 10 on the other side. And – you could bet into that all day long and you're not going to lose. You know that so that's the idea is is if you can create those markets by matching up lines of two different books, you know, you can that's the you're 90% of the way to making money sports betting if you do that. Yeah, and I think that's the mathematics or the the basically the logic behind why you want to shop around for the best price, right? Yep. Yep. For sure. I mean, you know, people think of it like, you know, yeah, they think of it like – like I think a lot of people's process is even when they think of shopping, they think of, well, let me think of the team I want to bet on, right? Like I want to bet on the Packers right, and, right. Let, me, and right. let me go shop for the best price I can find on the Packers. Well, that's fun. I mean if you want to bet on the Packers, great. But if, if your focus is not I want to bet on the Packers but I want to win money, right, which is right. a different focus, then it might be that there is no good price on the Packers, right? Like – and and right. and the way you can tell where there's markets that have good prices is by finding these no vig markets, right? So you know you might look at those Packer prices and you know you could get minus ten, you know minus seven, minus ten, and then you see minus seven, minus oh five, and you might say, oh, that's the best price. Let me buy the Packers. But 
you you don't have a no hold market there, right? You're still paying minus 05. Someone else has minus 10 on the other side. There's still a lot of hold there. Whereas you might see a different game and you might be able to get the hold completely gone for that market. And right. then you could basically flip a coin, bet either side and you won't lose money. And if you're smart and have an insight, then that's really how you start, you know, kind of finding better bets. Yeah, absolutely. And in the book, you talk about how, you know, maybe it's a combination of a money line and a point spread that forms right. that no hold market and understanding the vo the value of like a half point move here and there uh, and things like that. So, yep. And that stuff also changes, too. That's 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 a good place to get an edge because that can change from year to year. That relationship between, you know, OK, well, if. If the if the spread is minus three, then the you know the money line should be you know sixty percent you know minus one fifty or whatever, you know that might have been true ten years ago, and maybe it's true today, and maybe it's not true today. It depends on how they play the game, depends on the rules, and that's you know that's that's what getting an edge at sports betting is about. Is it's you know partly about understanding you know what's changed, you know yeah, versus absolutely. what was true in the well, past. And that's certainly part one of your points that you make in the book is like, yeah, sometimes you got to get your hands dirty, find some data and look at these relationships. Right. And not perhaps take what people thought it was 10 years ago uh, and look more at what happened in the, the last couple of years, especially in sports like football. Right. Right. Interesting. Awesome. Oh, go ahead. Ed. So, yeah. So, uh, Jim, if you had something on that, I, you should. You should no, go, go ahead. Absolutely. Cool. So um, we also want to talk a little bit about how the hold is pertinent to parlays as well. Um, the general perception is that they're, they're bad bets, but uh, you kind of push back on that idea in the book. Uh, can you tell us about that? Right. So I, I think this is kind of a, a key point. Um, so let's just take let's just take a three team parlay just for the example here. Right. So so the way a three team parlay typically works is, you know, you get. Three, let's just say you're taking three bets. They're all minus 110. They're all on the point spread or whatever. You're taking three sides, right? Well, then that parlay is going to pay, you know, six to one, right? And that's roughly the same math as – that's almost exactly the same math as if you took, say, $110, bet it on the first game. If you win that game, now you got 210. You bet 210 at minus 110 on the second game. You win that one. And then you take whatever the cash out price was on that second ticket, bet it on the third game at minus 110, and you win that one. Well, guess what? That pays six, basically six to one on your $110 bet, right? So that's, that's all a parlay is. It's, it's, it's really just taking the win on the previous bet and rolling it over onto the next bet, right? So there's nothing inherently kind of like – vigged or bad about that i mean this, you're just making you know now now there are short pay parlays which is a different story but you know just your basic parlay is just making one bet rolling over the winnings onto the next bet rolling it over into the next bet so it gets a bad rap because they say oh well parlays hold more like that three team parlay is going to hold 12 percent well it's holding 12 percent if you're taking 12 percent of the original 110 dollars bet but if you actually just break the parlay down into its actual bets, it's not a $110 bet. It's a $110 bet plus sometimes another $210 bet plus sometimes another 400 whatever you know dollar bet, you know, on top of that. And if you kind of like average all that out, the total amount bet tends to be more like 300 than 100. So what it really is, the way we kind of talk about it in the book is no it's well it's holding 12% on a $100 bet. It's actually holding 4%, which is the normal hold, on a $300 bet. You're really just betting more money when you bet a parlay It's it, ra rather than thinking of it like – you know, and, and, and the reason why this is a key point is because you're only – it's only holding more for the house if you're making bad bets in the first place. You know, If you're making good bets, then you hold more, right? You're on the, you're on the winning side of that calculation. You know, which is which is the key point. You know, a lot of people are, you know, because I see like, oh, parlays are sucker bet parlays or, you know, whatever. And this it's just not true. You know, it all it is is, yeah, if you're making three bad bets in the first place, well, then parlay them is a sucker bet. But if you're making three good bets in the first place, then it's it's anything but. And that and that was the main point we wanted to make in the book. 
Right, and it's it's a way to get down more money as well, right? It, it you get down more money. You could potentially take advantage of correlations if you can get some of those through. You can sometimes you can bypass you know betting limits on you know certain markets, especially lower limit markets. Sometimes you can get you know a few extra dollars on a you know I, I'm sure that's come up for some people in the in this new world where there's. Belarusian soccer and so and so <laughs> ping pong and whatever and you know there's operators out there that are you know trying to trying to take you know trying to offer those markets but they don't know what to do. <laughs> and so they're they're putting it out for you know a hundred dollar limit or something but you know maybe you can if, if you got a real strong opinion about you know Russian ping pong or something <laughs> then then you can you can you probably at some places get more down you know if you if you do a round robin or a parlay. So, yeah, it's really interesting. And one thing you touched on there is correlations. And I think that another way to look at this is talking about what you called related markets within the book. So if you had to explain related markets, what are they and what are some ways we can use them to our advantage, whether it be betting parlays or just looking for optimal bets in general? Right. So so there's the there's kind of like there's kind of two concepts here. So one is is a related parlay like in its basic sense is two bets on the same event right so if it's anytime you're making two bets on the same sporting event those bets are going to be related in some way in other words if you win the first bet that's going to have some some impact on whether you win the second bet or not you know now the let's say just a dead obvious example is well i want to bet the packers to win in the first half and i want to bet them to win the game well, obviously, if the Packers win the first half, they're more likely than they were your pregame to win the game, you know, and vice versa. If they lose, then, you know, you lose your parlay, but you were probably going to lose both bets anyway, right? So that that's the basic idea of a correlated parlay. Now, sports books know about this. <laughs> so nobody's going to let you bet, you know, a first half team with a game, you know, at at. The, the standard parlay pricing, right? Standard parlay pricing assumes you're betting on independent events. Now, I I saw I actually saw something just to, not to you know to plug FanDuel a little bit. FanDuel has this like same game parlay uh, feature that I noticed for football, and I, I thought it was pretty cool, where you can kind of mix and match your same game bets, build a parlay, and then the the little FanDuel kind of reprices the parlay for you based on how correlated they are so i thought that was a cool so that's kind of one way of getting around that um but but the, so 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 that's the first thing i mean i mean i said no one's gonna let you bet a first half with a game but there still are you know correlated bets that some some sports folks will let you make they'll let you bet sides with totals sometimes sometimes they'll let you bet i mean there you can make correlated bets and then sometimes in in products like fanduel's product or i've seen them in parlay cards or other sports books you know they're they open it up and they say yeah go ahead and make a correlated bet you know we're gonna price it so that you don't beat us well sometimes they screw up (laughs) and you you can beat that so you know that's that's another you know but then then on top of that, sometimes there's kind of correlated I, – I, the easiest way to explain it is like a correlated angle. Like like let's say you think that, you know, there's a brand new uh, – well, I, I think the example in the book we use is the Korean Baseball League, which all of a sudden became a lot more relevant. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and like weather in Korea. I mean Korea is a small country, you know, and I'm sure, you know, I don't – I never really followed Korean baseball very closely, but I'm sure that the weather tends to be, you know, correlated, you know, from one park to the next, right? So weather is a huge deal in baseball totals, you know, if it's hot this way over whatever, right? So, or like, if you think that the, the, there's something with the ball or there's something with anything that you think is systematic, that's changed in a sport, well, you can parlay those together. So let's say, I mean, let's say you just think that, that, for some reason, their ball is different in Korean baseball this year, and they're just going to hit more home runs. You know, you know, nothing nefarious is going on. It's just a sensitive thing, and you want to bet over. Well, if you parlay all the overs, then if you're right, you're like extra right, if that makes sense. It lets you get more leverage on that one concept by parlaying kind of the concept among different events. So, 
Excellent. Yeah. So uh, you talked in the beginning about your company, uh, Deck Prism Sports. Uh, you guys specialize in in-play betting uh, with the company. You guys provide services to sports books. Give us a little bit of your opinion on, you know, the advantages of betting in-game versus pre-game. Sure. So, so pre-game, you know, I mean, so on one hand, it's all the same, right? What it, what is what is a betting line? It's basically the price of something happening given all the available information, right? So, you know, the 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 only difference is the pre-game that information comes in kind of at a trickle. Right. So they put those football lines up on, you know, Sunday night or Monday or whenever they're going to do it for the next week, you know, and then there's a little flurry of betting at the opener. Right. So somebody somebody somewhere has to be the first one to say minus six, put it on the board. Right. You know, (laughs) I mean, somebody has to do that. So somebody does that. And then, you know, smart people with models basically sit there trying to vulture that number (laughs) And, you know, and they take a small limit and, you know, the smart people bang on it and move the number. And, you know, and then it kind of kind of settles. Right. All that flurry of activity is over. There's no one else who really wants to take a look at that number and and bet it. And it just kind of sits there and, you know, it'll move a little bit. But then, you know, and then then a little bit of news will come out. Okay, Wednesday, so and so is questionable at practice or, or, you know, whatever, just a little trickle of news that comes in might move a market, you know, and then and then there's also more information as as bigger as the limits go up and bigger better start to participate, you know, that adds information to the mix. But it all happens slowly over a week, right? Then, you know, Sunday at nine fifty nine West Coast, right? Nine fifty nine AM Right, they're about to start the games. That's kind of max pregame information. Those lines are are you know pretty solid and pretty well incorporate all the available information that you know to that point. And then the ball kicks off, and and the information is like a fire hose. <laughs> all of a sudden, it went from like a slow trickle all week long to just literally new information every second. Right, every time they run a play, every time someone gets injured, every time there's a score, every time anything happens in any game, it's a new piece of information, and it's like a more important piece of information than like an entire <laughs> week's worth of information at that point. Right, so that's the problem with in-game betting is you have to. That's the core problem for a sports book operator is. How do we incorporate this fire hose of information and update our pricing on all these games in real time and offer it to our betters and like not suck at? It? <laughs> <laughs> hard, and it's a very hard problem, and it's it's one that you know my partner Matt and I have gotten good at over the years. You know, kind of more from the better side. You know, we we it's the exact same problem, but on the better side, we say, you know, how do we how do we incorporate this fire hose of information and make good betting lines, you know, you know, to get good bets. And we said, what's the exact same problem on the operator side? And, you know, and and it's hard. So that's that's you know, that's the problem we're trying to solve. And and, and frankly, you know, the the betting operators, you know, it's a mixed bag how good a job they do of it, to be honest with you. You know, it's, 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 right. you know, so sometimes it's not so hard. I mean, you know, there's a kickoff and, and it's a touchback. Well, guess what? You don't have to move the line very much, you know, and then, and then, you know, and then they run it up the middle and they get a first down and then they punt and then the other team gets the ball. And guess what? That I mean, that's, you know, the right line there is, is pretty easy, you know, but then when games start going off the rails, when weird things happen, you know, anytime later in the game, you know, it just becomes much, much harder to, you know, I mean, you got to come up with a price like that and, yeah. and then, you know, and then they run a play and then it's time for a new point, you know, a new price. And, the, and it's just a hard problem. And, and, you know, the operators kind of do a, a mixed job of it and that's where the betters can take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean that kind of reminds me of the Super Bowl when Kansas City was struggling in the third quarter, uh, looked terrible. Uh, I would bet that your odds for them to come back and win that game were probably a little bit better than some of the markets were. Yeah, I mean we definitely we definitely had. I mean cer- certainly we definitely had them coming back more than some of the models I was looking at did. And and I'm I think you're right, Ed. You know about about where we were at on that particular game. And um, yeah, I mean it's just. You know, it, it's and the other thing is books all have different prices, too. I mean, there's no there's no one answer. You know, there's there's different pricing feeds. This book gets it from company A. This book gets it from company B. This 
you know, book, you know, rolls their own, you know, they got some guys in a room that put their own lines up. Everybody's got different, you know, and, and there's no time, at least not now. This is not the way the technology works. There's no time for consensus to be built before everyone puts a line up. They just throw up whatever they got, right? And they say, come yeah. and get it, right? And, and, you know, and so different books will definitely have completely different lines. So it's, it's much easier to find no-hold markets, to find markets where there's clear arbitrages, where you could, you could, if you could get both down, you could just bet both sides and lock in a profit. Now, I don't recommend that. I recommend, you know, whenever that comes up, try to figure out, usually one bet's good and one bet's bad. It's usually better to use your brain and try to guess what the good one is rather than just bet them both like a robot, you know, but. Right. Um, well, yeah. if you can, if you can figure it out in the amount of time, and right. as you also talk about in the book, if you can make sure that sports book's not going to reject your bet for right. whatever insane reason they're going to do. Right. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's the thing we're trying to, you know, the, that's another kind of, kind of reason why we started deck prism sports is because we know that in play betting you know can be a frustrating experience for people too because you know i mean for various reasons and i don't you know need to get into the nitty-gritty details but like operators reject a lot of those bets they basically say no thank you you know how about how about this worst bet <laughs> I mean, they're, not, they're not trying to do that i mean i'm not saying they're trying to like you know give a bad experience it's more it's honestly more of a technical problem than anything but um, but that's the reality for the better is if you try to make in play bets at a lot of sports books, you know, a lot of those bets are going to get rejected. Well, I don't I don't think that's a very good experience. You know, nobody likes having their bets rejected, especially because guess which bets get rejected. It's the, the good, good ones. One. <laughs> so it's the ones you find you're like, ah, that's a good one. And then they're like, no, thank you. You know, so, you know, whereas when you fat finger, I mean, every fat fingered bet I've ever <laughs> tried to make has gone right through, you know, so uh yeah, I mean, so, so you know, our goal is to kind of solve the technical problems that the sportsbook operators have so that they don't have to reject bets. So that if you see a price, if you see a bet, you want that bet, you know, as long as it's live on your app or your, you know, you know web browser or whatever, as long as you click on it and say, yes, I could bet, you get that bet, right? And that's the experience I think, you know, we're kind of shooting for. I think the industry should be shooting for. And, you know, our goal as a company is to, build the technology that lets operators, you know, deliver that experience. And it also helps that like you and Matthew are betters. So like you kind of know what the pitfalls are and what the issues are with live betting. And it seems like you've taken that into account in building out deck prism. And so I think that's definitely helpful there, but what was that process like? Because you have live models for multiple sports. You had to yep. build all those out. And like you said, there are so many things, so many pieces of information to consider when building out those models. So how long did that process take to actually build all that out for all the different sports that you offer? So, I mean, I've been working with Matt for about five years. Um, and, you know, a big chunk of that time has been spelt, spent, you know, building and refining these models. You know, our, our focus, like our, our kind of like, philosophy behind it is 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 we want to automate as much as possible up to the point where you can't automate it right and where the human is going to do better right that's that's our philosophy and so we kind of build all our models with that in mind we, we we build it with where where they're all designed to be kind of like it's kind of like a big ship right so the ship will kind of you know if the seas are smooth you know as long as they're running up the middle for three yards <laughs> you know then the model kind of operates itself right it's all you know you don't really have to but if something happens right if there's an iceberg or there's a storm or whatever's <laughs> happening right then then the whole goal of the model is to provide what the operator needs to you know steer out of the way to try to get that model on a better course and that that's kind of the best analogy i have for what we built and what we're you know trying to deliver i i think it's i mean you know i've seen people say oh we're gonna just you know just just kind of automate everything right you know where they're just like you know it's it's just the computer the model is accounts for everything um and you know in real time and you know there's people that try to do this from the betting side where they just want to you know, they just want to, you know, hit go and then and then, you know, you know, go out to a, I guess not to a bar anymore. <laughs> and they're going to go sit in their in their in their man room or whatever I don't know what they're going to do today. But, you know, they kind of want to hit go and then and then kind of check to see how much they want in the morning. And, and 
you know, I, I think that approach can work. I mean, I definitely think that that I think that that kind of like the betting opportunities are good enough today that that purely automated approach can work. But I think the the kind of semi automated, there's always a person to kind of steer the ship um, approach. I think it's better. You know, now it's definitely the approach we've taken and 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 hopefully we're right that it's the best approach for a while. So, yeah. All righty. That is Ed Miller. Make sure you check out the book he and Matthew Davido uh, wrote together called The Logic of Sports Betting. There is a link to it up on the site on numberfire.com. Ed, I appreciate you swinging by and taking time to chat with us today. Good luck with the business. Good luck with the betting. Good luck with everything weird that's going on in our, our world right now. I appreciate it, and hopefully we can talk to you again soon. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having me on. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Covering the future. One final thank you to Ed Miller for swinging by and spreading his knowledge and talking about his book, The Logic of Sports Betting. And Ed, it's always fun to talk to really smart people. And Ed Miller, I think, fully qualifies as being in that category. Absolutely. I was talking to Rufus a couple years at the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, uh, Rufus Peabody. And uh, we were talking about what Ed was doing. And Rufus was like, yeah, he's a smart dude. And yes, he he really is. Uh, Widely held opinion. Uh, Please give him a follow on Twitter. Um... Pretty easy to find him. I, I really don't know why he has fewer followers than I do. He's, he's way more <laughs> active and uh, a great follow and lots of great insights. And, and definitely check out the book as well. Yeah, and uh, Ed does a lot of modeling stuff, which he was talking about, which is applicable to, right. as we were talking about last week, COVID-19 stuff. And Ed was kind of the first person who really put on my radar that this was kind of a legit situation. So Ed, smart in a lot of realms. And I think that that knowledge of modeling, knowledge of math, valuables make sure you follow ed on twitter at ed miller poker uh let's move into covering the future now and ed for this we're gonna move back to the bundesliga because we were talking last week about home field advantage and how our sample on it was relatively small and knowing what the lack of crowds would do but each week that sample gets larger uh so what have you seen so far when it comes to home field within the bundesliga specifically yeah, so I've been tracking this, and uh, I got a chance to go look back on a full season last year of what the home court, home sorry, home field advantage was, and it was uh, 0.4 goals. So that gives us kind of a baseline for comparison. Uh, I'm going to grab a couple more years there to, to make that number a little bit better and kind of look how that compares to other top European leagues as well, but haven't had a chance to quite do that yet. Last week I told you about how uh, the road teams had actually scored more goals uh, 0.78 goals more uh, through the first weekend of the Bundesliga. We've had another weekend. We had a couple games yesterday. Uh, my data set only goes through yesterday's games. Uh, away teams are still scoring more goals at almost the exactly same rate. So 0.77 goals. Obviously, there's still a pretty small sample size here. Uh, when you do the standard error, it's about uh, about half a goal. Okay, so it's it, we're not you know we're not we can't be conclusive at all that uh, I mean I don't think there's going to be an away advantage right. when, when we look at this, but um, it it certainly looks like the there's not going to be as much of a home advantage, home advantage without the crowds. Talked a little bit about uh, how they're pumping in some pseudo fan noise in in the Dortmund game. Uh, I think these are going to be pretty even matches, and uh, we'll continue to follow this and, and let you guys know. I'm very curious about your your priors on this uh, when it comes to home field advantage, um, specifically when it comes to travel. Because when we're talking about the Bundesliga, we're talking about uh, the KBO, the area traveled is going to be smaller. Yeah. Your priors on that. Do you think that things will change as we get to sports where away teams have to travel further? What is your baseline assumption going in when it comes to different leagues and the variations they may have as we get to those? Yeah, that's a really good question because obviously we have a big country here where teams can go three time zones uh, in order to play a game. Um, you know, I haven't really thought about that much, yeah. to be honest. Uh, something something I should look into more. Uh, I think when Nate Silver was doing his NCAA analysis, he did find that the further a team traveled, the the less well they performed. Um so yeah, that that could be an issue, but but then again, you know, I mean, with a lot, you know, some your analysis might not even be that detailed, right? Right. So and to, I think at the first level, you kind of want to get well. Can we make some estimate about 
the reduction in home advantage when there are no fans. And, and that's the first thing to do. And I think that that's important, too, because what you're doing with the Bundesliga analysis is comparing the same league. Like, it's comparing like to like. Right. You're looking at the goals last year versus the goals or in previous years versus the goals this year. And the travel situation was the exact same then that it is now. So right. I think that it's still applicable regardless of what our yeah. priors are about the role, the role of travel. So it'll be interesting to see how, how this tracks as the sample expands. But uh, I'm glad that you are keeping tabs on it. And uh, I look forward to further enhancements to this because it's just it's it's such a fascinating thing to finally get like a kind of semi-controlled experiment on the impact of crowds yep yeah it's a great data set all right so let's move on here uh to my covering the future and i want to talk about baseball because ed there's been a lot of weird stuff in the in the news recently about baseball we don't know if there's gonna be a season i don't know if there's gonna be a season you don't know if there's gonna be a season who knows but what we do know is that if they do play it's going to be a shorter season than we'd have in a regular year. The most likely scenario as of right now seems to be that they will play just 82 games, which is about half the usual mark. And in 82 games, when you're reducing that sample size so much, things can get pretty weird. You can see a lot more randomness in individual player and individual team performance as well. So it feels like a good time to take some swings at long shots to win individual awards. The biggest market where, at least in my eyes, where you would benefit from randomness is with the American League MVP award because hitter stats are volatile to begin with over a full season. But then you also put in the fact that there's Mike Trout at plus 140 to win MVP. And to me, that's way too short given the circumstances. But having him in the pool is also going to inflate the number of everybody else, potentially opening up some value within the AL MVP odds. And the biggest value to me is Yuan Moncada at 75 to 1. Moncada is super, 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 super volatile as a player. He strikes out too much. Uh, he can get into some terrible slumps. But that volatility can work in his favor too. And he can occasionally hit the high end of that range of outcomes. And we saw that exactly that last year, where he finished with 5.7 wins above replacement based on Fangraph's algorithm that ranked ninth in the American League. And that was despite getting just 559 plate appearances because he was on the injured list in August. Now, we should make in some regression for Moncada for sure, because the strikeout rate that he had is not in line with the batting average he had. So he's going to regress. But even when you do bake in that regression, projection six systems do still like him. For a full season, Dan Zaborski, uh, his Zips projections at Fangrass have Moncada 15th in the American League and projected wins above replacement. And everybody who has a better war projection than Moncada is 50 to 1 or shorter to win the American League MVP. And again, Moncada is 75 to 1. He made really good strides defensively over at third base. He trimmed his strikeout rate entering his age 25 season. And given how high the highs can be when he hits them, I think 75 to 1 is a really intriguing number. But just in general, I think that it's a wise time right now to go through player award markets see which players and which markets may change due to the increased volatility of a shorter season. It doesn't seem like the numbers, at least the American League MVP ones, are fully accounting for that as much as they should yet. So I think it's a weird situation where we're getting to take advantage of volatility and maybe the books are not accounting for it as much as I would think that they would, allowing us to maybe bet someone like Yohan Moncada to win the American League MVP award. Ed, randomness is tough to quantify and it's going to be interesting to see how this season plays out. Sure. What's your view of baseball? Uh, because you can bet it. You can bet like win percentages now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Would you be more inclined to go to those markets with a, a shorter season? Uh, or are you kind of inclined to shy away from win percentage markets just because the sample is going to be like legitimately half of what it usually is? Yeah, I mean, I'm still at the point where I'm just praying that there's a season. <laughs> Something to talk about. I mean, the idea that there's not going to be a season at all is a little horrifying. Yeah. Um, both for the kind of the health of baseball in general. I mean, you know, also like I don't want to be robbed of a year of Mike Trout's prime. Like that's that's exactly. my motivation. Don't take that from me. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of other exciting things going on in baseball as well. Um, one of them not being the Tigers, but but anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what I, I had. You know, I haven't put a ton of thought into it yet. Um, you know, when you talk about maybe playing in July, that's still a month away. That gives me plenty of time to 
to look at how projections are going to change and and the models that I do look at, uh, you know, fan graphs, baseball perspective, prospectus, uh, Clay Davenport, things that I've that I've kind of tracked over the years. So, um, yeah, need to put some more thought into it, but we, we have some time. I think it's really fun because, you know, one thing Ed was talking about was weather. And weather is huge in American baseball, too, uh, except in, in a different sense. Because basically what you're getting is usually, like Target Field, for example, in Minnesota, usually you're getting both, like, winter Minnesota and, and like, summer Minnesota. But here, you're just going to get... You're just going to get straight summer, which means it's going to yeah. be a lot warmer, a lot more humid. That's yeah. going to change park factors, which is so interesting yeah. from like a, a run total perspective. And, and totals do a pretty good job of accounting for weather. Uh, so I'm not saying like you can just like hammer overs on all cold weather places, uh, but or generally cold weather places. But like for fantasy, like that changes the value of uh, different players. It changes their value for daily fantasy. So. I'm excited for that part too. It's just going to be, it's going to be very different. And I just really hope we have a season very selfishly. I just want to watch this play out at this point. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That is all we have for this week. Unless you had anything else you wanted to add in here. Are we all good? Yeah, we're all good. I was just going to say like, I, I, I'm still, you know, I, I honestly read uh, the, you know, sports websites more now than I ever have just because the whole concept of news is, You know, I kind of see myself as kind of, you know, I try to stay away from kind of the typical storylines. But now it's like we need, you know, there's a lot of news out there in terms of what we're going to do. And, I, you know, we heard all this talk about the NBA going Disney World and perhaps having a season. And I'm just really kind of hoping they do a single elimination tournament there. I'm in. Like just, again. just see, just see the. Well, even like with hockey, talking about their round robin tournament. Yeah, I know I'm from Minnesota, so I should like hockey. I don't watch a lot of hockey, but like if they were to do a round robin tournament or like really short series for playoff hockey, like that would get me in. And I'm just like, my level of interest is generally just not that high. So, sure. I think that like viewership could be nuts for that, but also the same thing for the NBA, which is a larger sport in yeah. general. So. If I the think, idea is to get people like me to tune in, that would do it. Yeah, and I did, but I thought the NHL was going back to a pretty typical looking playoff format as They're of this doing morning. 24 teams making the playoffs. Right. Um, right. I don't know what, what the, I didn't read fully on the format, but like the way it works, I think they wanted best of seven series like later on, but like yeah. the early rounds, people are going to be skating their butts off. It's going to be fun. I'm excited okay. for that. Okay. Let's we'll get Cal's uh, thoughts on this. Cal's an NHL guy. So maybe we can get, uh, we'll have Cal on as a guest and he can break down the NHL for us uh, at some point. Uh, oh. What do you got going on over the Power Rank and the football analytics show this weekend? Uh, yeah, nothing much, honestly. I'm working on some long term projects uh, with football right now. Uh, some of them have to do with turnovers. So um, hopefully, have some news on that pretty soon. All right. But, uh, you know, follow- you can always follow my stuff at thepowerrank.com. And uh, at the Power Rank on Twitter as well. That is Ed. I am at Jim Sanis, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Make sure you're, you are subscribed to Covering the Spread as we get these podcasts out, usually Wednesday afternoon, but uh, the schedule can be a bit fluid there. So make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts so you can get these podcasts right as they are posted. Big thank you to Ed Miller for swinging by and talking about his book, The Logic of Sports Betting. Uh, Once again, if you want a link for that book, it is on numberfire.com in the podcast post for this. It links directly to Amazon there. Uh, The book that Ed wrote with Matthew Davidow. And as Ed mentioned, follow Ed Miller on Twitter at Ed Miller Poker. Thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today and chopping up the clips for the FanDuel Twitter account and eventually bringing us NHL knowledge for the podcast as well thank you cal and thank you to everyone for tuning in hopefully uh things are going well for you hopefully you had a great memorial day weekend and hopefully you're having good luck with your sports betting as we progress into the the arena where sports are slowly and finally coming back into our lives we'll talk to you again soon this has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network (laughs) 